meeting on the fourth Sunday after Pentecost comes from St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Brethren, I reckon that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come that will be revealed in us. For the eager longing of creation awaits the revelation of the sons of God. For creation was made subject to futility, not by its own will, but by reason of him who made it subject, in hope. Because creation itself also will be delivered from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the sons of God. For we know that all creation groans and travails in pain until now. And not only it, but we ourselves also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption as sons of God, the redemption of our body in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Luke. At that time, while the crowds were pressing upon Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by Lake Gennesaret. He saw two boats moored by the lake, but the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. And getting into one of the boats, the one that was Simon's, he besought him to put out a little from the land. And sitting down, he began to teach the crowds from the boat. But when he had ceased speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and lower the nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said to him, Master, the whole night through we have toiled and have taken nothing, but at thy word I will lower the net. And when they had done so, they enclosed a great number of fish, but their net was breaking. And they beckoned to their comrades in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had made. And so were also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. Henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left all and followed him. Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Three loves mark the Father, three loves mark the Son, and three loves mark the Holy Ghost. In the Holy Father, we have the preference, his love of preference, he preferred each and every one of you over all creation. He preferred each and every one of you over all the possibilities in his divine mind. He preferred you. And because he preferred you, he chose you for these days. He makes no mistakes. He chose us for these days, and the Father then says, I will accept what my children will do. And we wound him. Every son, every daughter, to every father, always wounds the father through disobedience, through meanness, whatever it may be. But there's a wounding. And that wounding causes the father to cry out, Whom might I send? Whom might I send to bring these wayward children of mine back into my love, into the heaven that is promised for those who do love? And a voice from his very heart came forth and said, Father, send me. 
Father, send me the eternal Son. Now, in sending the eternal Son, He is giving us the pattern for our salvation. What is the pattern? The pattern of the Son's love. The humiliation of humanity. He accepted our nothingness, our dirt. He became one with us. Not only did He become one with us, in and through the womb of our Blessed Mother, but then He became our Redeemer. He was humiliated by the crucifixion of His own body. And then He humiliates Himself by giving to each one of us His body in the Most Holy Eucharist. The Holy Spirit takes up the refrain and says to us, you must first of all understand that our Lord, humiliated, is here to convict you of the wounding that you did to your Father. And so we are, convicted of our own sin. The sin that creates revenge, the sin that creates hatred, the sin that creates pride. We are condemned, but we convict ourselves and confess our sins and then the Holy Spirit says, Now, as you have been forgiven, go forth and forgive. The final act of the Holy Ghost is this. You are capable now of forgiving even the one who seeks to murder you. These are the nine stages of the Father's love expressed through the Holy Trinity. And we find ourselves in one of those stages. We find ourselves asking the question today on Father's Day, what is it that fathers must do? A woman, after one year of marriage, took her husband Bob aside, and she was pregnant, and soon she would give birth to her child, the first child, the first of many. She said to her husband, Bob, if you want holy children, leave them to me. If you want saints, then you must every day speak to them the word that comes to you from God. Speak about the saints, speak about their lives, teach them the love that is inculcated in each one of them. Bob told me he made a resolution from that time, as soon as his children were of the age of reason, every night, he would speak to them about the love of God manifesting itself in and through the saints. St. John Bosco, St. Philip Neri, St. Therese, the little flower, St. Teresa, the great. He had a whole repertoire. But every night, he would speak to those boys and those girls. Those boys and those girls, as they grew up, formed a school. It's called the School of Saints, the Holy Innocents, found in... St. Cloud, Minnesota. That man, his wife died several years ago, but that father gave everything over to these children. And what does he do now? He lives in a boiler room. And the plank is about this wide that he sleeps upon. And there he practices dying. He's up about 90. Still working. But he's a father who did what had to be done. He gave the seed of truth to his children, the seed of truth that was begotten many years ago in the womb of Our Lady. Now here we have the situation of St. Peter. Our Lord Jesus Christ is healing, touching the hearts of everyone because they have been healed in their physical nature. And look what happened. People pressured him. They want to touch him. They want power to go from him into themselves. So what do they do? They push, shove. They don't care about respect. And so our Lord Jesus Christ sees two ships. And he gets into the one of Simon Peter. He puts out a little ways. And now he begins the second part of the healing. Through his word, he begins to heal their souls teaching them how to proceed in the method of coming to know their Father. 
Peter, Simon, is listening. Andrew's in the boat. And our Lord Jesus Christ finishes healing their souls and says to Peter, Put out into the deep. Duke and Alton, put out into the deep. In other words, now, we move from the shallowness of life into the depths of the interior life. What does Peter do? Look, Master, you're a carpenter. You don't know anything about fishing. We worked all night, and we got nothing. And you, a carpenter, are going to tell me to go out into the deep and lower my nets for a catch. This is not the time to lower your nets for a catch. But Peter said, I will humor you. Now remember, he said, Master. Nobody can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Ghost. Remember, at the Last Supper, they cast the question when Jesus said, One of you is about to betray me. Ten said, Is it I, Lord? One said, Is it I, Master? And one said, Who is it? Master. When we use that term in referring to our Lord Jesus Christ, we are lowering him to the level of a human being. And so Peter must be taught, as each and every one of us must be taught. And so our Lord opens his arms, the net is placed down into the water, and the amount of fish is just overabundance. They call the second ship. The first ship represents the bark of Peter. The second is the synagogue. The synagogue has to wait until this bark of Peter goes through its journey in this life. And then, as it's massed all the people, what will happen? The net will break. What is the net? The net is the word of preaching, the word of the doctrine that Christ has given to us. When that net begins to break, when heresy begins to enter into the bark of Peter, we call upon the synagogue. Those who were perfidious, those who did not accept Jesus as Son of God, we call upon them, come and help us. And our Lord Jesus Christ says, when the two come together, end of time. The ship will be full. Both ships will be full. And we will find that peace that comes to us because now we will have our vocation. Our vocation. To go forth and to capture men. To go forth and to make Jesus lovable by the lives in which we live. Each one of us is a standard whereby others seek to enter into the mystery of Christ himself. But what, would he have, what has happened? Each one of us has to know the faith, has to know what God has asked us to believe, and then put it into practice in our lives. It happened that St. John Bosco was told by our Blessed Mother, you must gather the boys. They will look like they are lions and wolves and, and dogs and everything else, but you will conquer them. How will you conquer them? By reason. Because reason is the root of all. I must have truth. Truth is the root in which I, as an individual Catholic, begin to enter more deeply into the mystery of Christ. Reason knows the truth. Its object is truth. The reason, then, gives us a rod. The rod is faith. Reason opens itself, and faith now gives it a greater intense light. And the intense light gives then the soul the ability to give fruit. The fruit is charity. To begin to understand that the love of God now is manifested in and through these nine actions of the Trinity. And those nine actions of the Trinity are meant to be lived out in my life. <coughs> now we know that our spiritual life must go through a purgation. That is why we say the first step in spiritual life is to purge myself of mortal sin. If I do not purge my life of mortal sin, I will always be divided. The consequence of the division is that I'm never happy. I'm criticizing, I'm putting everybody else down, but I myself am in the pits. 
until I subordinate my attitude, my way of living to the glory of God and wipe out all attachment to mortal sin, I will never enter into the illuminative law. I will always find that I'm divided. I'm always going to find that I'm having difficulties because God has to give us a constant push to move us up. He puts pressure upon us. Just like Jesus was pressured by the crowd. He had to move to a new location to illuminate them. The illumination is indicated by him sitting in the boat. Illumination begins to do battle against that which is venial sin and imperfections. And venial sins and imperfections are indicated by my spiritual life by the desire to manipulate, the desire to control. I want my self-satisfaction over the glory of God. Hence, the lack of humility. When the soul begins to realize that I'm holding back, I'm getting lights from Almighty God, the sermons are making sense to me, everything is making sense to me, but I'm holding on to my way. I must release, I must subordinate venial and imperfections to the glory of God. In each step, I must go to my end. I am created to give glory to Almighty God. That is our vocation. That is why at the end of this parable, our Lord Jesus Christ says, Now you shall go forth and capture men, the souls of men. Now we're moving. We move into the unitive life when we have subordinated all mortal sins to the devil. We subordinate venial sins and imperfections to the trash heap of history. And we now come to the fact that exclusively all I do, think, and say is for the glory of God and the salvation of souls. When that happens, I have now entered into the unit of life. Now God will reveal to me new ways of prayer, new ways of entering into knowing His life, so that now I will become unique in the holiness that God wants. That's why every saint you look at has a unique expression of holiness. Because of their characters, everyone is unique. So Don Bosco, what did he do in order to form all of these boys from being monsters into being lambs? It's called the good night. The same thing that Mr. Bob Sis did, Don Bosco had tried to inculcate into the Salesian life. The good night. At the end of the day, after the night prayers and everything else, the good father of the house, the director of the house, is meant to come up before all of the boys and give them a three to five minute thought that they might go into their bed in grand silence and reflect upon that one thought that that good father gave to them at the end of the day. This good night then focused upon the glory of God corrected the errors in the family, and brought them to realize, everyone, this is the next step for us as a family to move forward in the life of Christ. For this reason, Don Bosco initiated what are known as nosegays. Nosegays were little sentences, do all for the glory of God and the salvation of souls tomorrow. Find someone who irritates you. Find a situation that bothers you. Offer that for the glory of God and the salvation of a sinner who is dying this day. And you will save souls. How many of us as Catholics take account of our life and say, have I saved a soul today? You don't have to know this is a soul that I saved. You just have to know that God has given you an expression in order for you to take and offer a sacrifice and hence you will fulfill Our Lady of Fatima's desire. Many souls are going to help because not one Catholic says, I will accept a sacrifice today to save that soul. We come late to Mass. We come late to prayers. We come, we're bored because we don't have the excitement of understanding that God is calling us to a mystical vocation. Go forth and capture these sins the sinners that are out there that need to be saved. Last night, 
We went out for dinner, and we were going to have to wait an hour. But guess what? Every third Saturday, Bob's Big Boy has all these fancy Corvettes and fancy cars on display. So we went on display. And lo and behold, we had conversations, spiritual conversations, with more and more Catholics that didn't know what was happening in the world. And we had the opportunity to spread the word of God and say, if you like, come to Boston. You'll find the sacraments. You'll find the truth. We have an opportunity. We never know when it's going to come, but the opportunity is there. We make the sacrifice, and we say, for the glory of God and the salvation of these souls. One I found there had a car just like my dad's old 1929 roadster. And he had not been baptized, this man. You have not been baptized? He's ready to die, and he has not been baptized. I said, you better come to me and get baptized. Well, he said, how about if you come here on the third Saturday of next month? I said, no, it doesn't work that way. We have to have you come, learn, and then be baptized. But these are souls that we have to put the seed into. Every one of you is out there in the workplace. Don Bosco said that everyone becomes an instrument of God when they begin to seek out the soul and do that sacrifice that will bring that soul to God. We said that the manner in which we will achieve our salvation is through the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. That life was marked by humiliation. Humiliation. As long as we hold on to our pride, we will never make steps forward in the spiritual life. Love humiliation. Love it. Thank God for it. When they cast you down, when they curse you, when they do all these kind of things against you, what did our Lord say? Wonderful. Great. Because your name is written in heaven. Humiliation. Humiliation. Come before our Lord in the sacrament and say, Lord, you have humbled yourself that I might receive you today. Let me humble myself. We put ourselves up on these pedestals that we really don't need to be on. You're much freer when you're nothing. Believe me. You're much freer when you say, I am a dirt ball, and I need every grace that God can give to me. Take, for example, Sobrina Wormer. She lost a husband in the German Gestapo and the prison camps. She then was put into a prison camp herself. Her poor little boy, Mikhail, was a street person because Christians must not be treated well. You can't feed them. You don't do anything to them. Well, Sobrina Wormbrand went through the watching of her own family, seeing them murdered, one after the other. Well. Sabrina lived through it. She went and she re basically reunited with her husband who went through it, and Mikael, they're in California. And her husband, Richard, was one day with a man who was with the Gestapo. He said, you know this city in, he named the place in <coughs> Yugoslavia. Yeah, I know that city, the man said. Did you kill the Jews there? I killed every Jew in that city. Hmm. Do you believe that there's any such thing as forgiveness? No, he said. There is no such thing as forgiveness. Not in this world. Everybody's for themselves. My wife is upstairs. She has not heard this conversation. I will bring her down. He brought down Sabrina. Sabrina. And introduced this man. This is the man who killed your mother and your father and your seven brothers and your three sisters. Sabrina embraced him and kissed him on both cheeks and says, As God forgave you, so do I forgive you. The man humbled himself, went down to the floor weeping, and hence can save his soul. He humbled himself. We are so much involved in this world of pride that we don't recognize. We don't recognize it. And our Lord Jesus Christ had to humble Peter. What did Peter do? He fell before the knees of Jesus. He's our head. He's the Holy Father. 
he fell before the knees of Jesus and said, Lord, deliver me. Forget me. Get out of here. I am a sinful man. I am a sinful man. What do we have to claim for ourselves but sin? And what do we have to do in order to get rid of sin? <clears throat> Bend our knees and humble ourselves before Almighty God. That is why the most precious gift He has given to us is the sacrament of confession. And I will hear the confessions of those I were not able to hear before the Mass because I know that everybody wants to start Mass on time. I understand this. But I will continue hearing the confession of those who wish after Mass. Humiliation is the pathway to heaven. After that, you're free. You don't have to worry about anything else. You will put order into your life, and you'll begin to see the purgative life will be behind you. The illuminative life will continue to guide you, and then the unitive life will open up the mystery of prayer and union with Almighty God in such ways that you never thought could possibly be. So let us ask Almighty God this day, Lord, you have no hands but our hands to do your work today. You have no feet but our feet to lead others in your way. You have no tongue but our tongues to tell men and women how you lived and died. And you have no help but our help to bring others to your side. May we be humble enough to bring others to the side of Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.